Good morning. Welcome to Orange Baptist this morning. It's good to see all of you friends and guests with us. And we'd like to get to know who you are, guests. There's red, there are red books on each pew, and we'd like for you to take those and pass them down the aisle, everybody. And guests, as it comes by you, leave your name and a way to get in touch with you this week. And we surely will do that to get to know you a little bit better. There are some significant announcements in the bulletin. If you will take the time to make sure you look at those. Um, first of all, most important, is we have a, a picnic today. We have an exciting time uh, together out on the property uh, at 4 o'clock. we got a, a tent for shade today, and, we, and if it rains, it'll be for rain, but it doesn't look like it's going to be for rain. Um, so please come on out, um, bring a lawn chair, uh, some, somewhere to sit, and uh, a blanket, um, bring some games for the kids. I think I might take some cones out and set up. Some, a soccer game because we got a big old field for, to play soccer. So y'all come and play. Um, so, someone's excited. Um, so please come and, and just enjoy a great time of fellowship together out on our beautiful property in a new way that we haven't been able to experience it. So please come. Um, there is a survey that is in the bulletin that was included. It's a little little uh, piece of paper white piece of paper. Um, please, if, if you would, fill that out and put it in the offering plate as it comes by. Um, we're looking at what we're going to be offering on Wednesday nights this coming fall for the year. And um, we're just, we've, uh, we'd we like to know what the interest level is um, in uh, gender Bible studies or a joint Bible study of all ages, um, you know, young adults, youth through through senior adults. So please let us know what your interest level in that would be, and we'd like to accommodate that. Um, we're still looking for a few helpers on Wednesday nights uh, to help with music and missions in certain classes. So please, if you're able to, to help uh, in any way, uh, see Elisa or myself uh, or get in touch with us. And I'd like to invite um, the youth uh, search committee up to make an announcement. Um, regarding the hiring of a new youth ministry director. Good morning. Um, we are missing a few members. Um, we also had Jennifer Taylor and Dave McRae um, who weren't able to be with us this morning. Um, but we made up the youth search committee and in your bulletin, you will see a motion that we are bringing to the church, um, and I'll read that to you and then give you a little more information. The Youth Search Committee, with the agreement of the Personnel Committee, moves to hire Lindsay Wiles as part-time youth, youth ministry director with an annual salary of $18,000 per year and with 10 days of vacation. There will be a special called business meeting after worship on Sunday, September 9th to act on this motion. Because it would reflect a change in the budget, it requires a 40% quorum. Um, we looked around the state for a youth ministry director and after very careful consideration, we truly felt led um, to offer the position to one of our own, to Lindsay Wiles. Um, we're excited about what she envisions for our youth ministry program and what she can bring to not only the youth of our church but also to all of us and so we ask that you um, be here on September 9th again we need a 40 percent quorum to have this make a change to our budget so thank you so much thank you committee for your good work um, I'll, I'll also let you know that out in the vestibule there is a sheet of paper with the job description and more details included uh, in, the, in the center table there uh, in the vestibule. So please, please take a look at that on your way out as you're preparing uh, for the meeting that will be um, in two weeks um, on September 9th. According to our bylaws, it needs to sit on the table for a certain amount of time so we can have a special called meeting on September 9th to act on that motion as a congregation. Let us now enter into worship together.
please stand for the invocation? Let us pray together. Holy God, we enter into your sanctuary with reverence and expectation this morning, knowing that you are here with us. We long to encounter you in a new way, in a meaningful way this hour. So receive our worship, we pray. Speak to us your life-giving and life-changing word of grace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us pray together. Lord, you are a mighty fortress. You hide us in the cleft of the rock. You protect us against things of this world. And we praise you for your goodness and your grace. It's often so easy to, for, 
to go on in our lives acting as if we are in charge, as if we have all the authority and the entitlement to make decisions and act in certain ways while we forget that you are our creator, sustainer, the one who redeems us when we go astray. All life is a gift from you, and our lives we owe to you. And so, Father, help us to know that we must keep you in our sights, that we must live our lives according to your will. Be with those who grieve this morning, members of Judy Carter's family, such an advocate for this county, members of the McCain family, an advocate for our nation. Lord, such loss is sudden and difficult for loved ones, and it reminds us that we are not here permanently, but that we must use our time wisely. May we, your people, be ones who use the time we've been given to bring you glory and to give your love to those that we meet. For it's in your most holy name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for entrusting us with more than we deserve. Help us to steward it carefully, faithfully. Help us to be honest with ourselves and with you about where we are in this. If there are parts of our life that we are not investing, but we are spending, and it's all about things that matter here on earth, but will not matter in heaven, help us to stop spending and to start investing our lives into something that's going to matter in heaven and in someone else's life. We want desperately for our lives to have meaning in eternity and in the lives of others. God, help us. Give us eyes to see the world, people, and opportunities. To see money and resources as tools to use to grow heaven. We know that it is not about putting money in our church banking account. It is about how much money can flow through our account to touch the lives of people in Orange and around the world. And we know people don't have much time, so we need to be busy now. Help us to take hold of our purpose so we can give it all, all that we have, and let nothing in this world stop us. We trust you, we believe you, and we seek after you with everything that we have. Please use this offering for your glory. In the name of our Lord and Savior and the one who we follow, Jesus Christ, amen.
Would you please be seated and would our children come forward for the children's sermon? Good morning. All right, I have some pictures to show you. Um, and you can tell me, you can just say it out, um, when you recognize what it is, okay? You tell me what it is. And then after I show you all the pictures, there's going to be something that all the pictures have in common. Do you know what that means? The same, that has the same, okay? Ready. What is this? A scuba diver, yes. How about this guy? Football player, yeah. He's a pretty good football player, huh? What about this guy? Yeah, whoa, whoa, somebody woke up. <laughs> You're right. I know, we know some firefighters, don't we? What about this? Uh -huh. Yeah. What position? Does anybody know what position that is? Catcher, yeah. So what did all of those have in common? Hats. Mm, Emily says they have on hats. What else did they have in common? Some of them are sports. Some of them were sports. Not all of them. What What? Else? Um, with some, um, 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 hats. Suits. They have stuff to keep them protected. Ah, all right. You're right. All of you together came up with the idea that they have on some protective gear, right? Hats. What would happen if the firefighter went into the burning building without his protective gear on? What would happen, Landon? Um, he'll, um, he'll get burned. Yeah, might get burned. He couldn't breathe because he didn't have the tank. Yeah, so the scuba diver, if he didn't have his protective gear, he wouldn't be able to survive either, right? He couldn't bleed, breathe. And um, if he went down too deep, he couldn't take the water pressure Right, absolutely. So all those people, they need that protective gear, right? Or what would happen to them? They'll get, they'll get hurt or they wouldn't survive, right? So it was for their protection. Well, Paul, the writer of Ephesians, which is the verses that we're going to be reading today, um, tells us about special gear that we're supposed to put on to protect us. Now, why? why? Well, let's, re let's read about it first. Okay, he says the gear that we're supposed to put on. Stand firm then with a belt. We're supposed to put on a belt of truth buckled around our waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place. With your feet, listen to this, what's on your feet? They're fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition, take up a shield. What does this sound like? All these things that we're supposed to be putting on. Army men. Oh, kind of like army men. Yeah, like a soldier. A shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. There's that helmet again. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're supposed to put on this armor. And I wonder why. Why, when you ride a bike, how many of you have ridden a bike? Raise your hand. And what, does your, what might your mom and dad tell you to put on before you ride that bike? Every time. A helmet. Yeah, a helmet. And why? Is that because they really want your head to be really sweaty? No. no. What? Why? It's because you, your head doesn't want to get hot. Yes, they, they don't want your head to get hurt. And why do they not want your head to get hurt? Um, because, um, because, because if you fall down on your head and you bonk, your head, that will be super hard. Oh, yeah, it would be so bad if you bonked your head. Why do they not want you to get hurt? Because you could have to go to the hospital. Yep. Yeah. Do your parents really love you? Yes, good answer. They do. You're right. Do they tell you that a lot? And one of the ways that they show that they love you is by telling you to put on your helmet, by, by telling you to protect yourself. They're showing that they really love you. And so that's what Paul's telling us to do here is to put on all this armor 
every day, which I think you guys are going to talk about a little bit more down in Children's Church about what exactly that armor is. But it's to protect you. It's to protect you, and it's because God loves you that he wants to protect you. All right, let's talk to God right now, okay? Father God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you love us so much that you don't want to see harm happen to us. Thank you for giving us parents and people on this earth who will love us and protect us as well. Lord, I pray that we would be prepared for the day. Um, Lord, that you would help us to get ready each day um, to share your love with the world. In your name we pray. Amen. I was interested. It, it sounded like a great story. We're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. And that's on page 1020 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Well, today we are finishing up our series in Ephesians entitled, Live and Write. I told this story the first, time, first Sunday of the series at the beginning of August, but I remember back when I was younger, r driving around the streets of Richmond with my dad, and when he, we would hit all the green lights, he'd say, man, we're living right. And Ephesians has, has some things to say about living. And we've been looking at those things this month, living in community of the church, living in Christ, living more like Christ. Living with the Holy Spirit. And this week, living in the world. I heard a joke this week. What do you call a nun who sleepwalks? A Roman Catholic. <laughs> get it? Yep. Roaming. Okay, making sure you get it. Why am I telling jokes, you might ask? Well, in the, in the Greek... Orthodox tradition, the day after Easter, was devoted to telling jokes. They felt like they, that they were imitating the big joke that God pulled on Satan in the resurrection. They believed Satan had thought he had won, that he was smug in his victory, saying to himself that he had the last word, and so he thought. But then God raised Jesus from the dead and offered life and salvation, and that became the last word. Today we're dealing with battle, spiritual warfare, some people call it. We, we spent the last two weeks learning from Ephesians how to follow Christ and, and live in Christ. And, and this is building upon that, how to live in Christ in this world that has so much wrong with it. In a world that makes it difficult to live according to God's ways. 
This world is filled with powers of darkness, things that are not of God. And so we have sung about, and as our scripture talks about, we are to wage war against them. We are to fight against these powers. I grew up singing these songs, and they're fun to sing, Onward Christian Soldiers. Every church service at the camp that I worked at in the summers, we ended by singing Onward Christian Soldiers as we marched out of the chapel, singing as we went, marching as to war with the powers of darkness. But lots of people have had trouble with these songs and how they encourage militarism with any hint of violence. And unfortunately, many Christians have taken these songs and have carried them as the battle cry, marching off to actual war. And they've misunderstood the passage to mean that we fight people. The, the passage says we don't fight, fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities. But we have a gospel of peace, that we are to bring peace. But the song Onward Christian Soldiers and the passage itself are correct in one thing. And that is that if we're going to live in Christ, in this world, we're in for a fight. So we'd better get ready. It was true for the Christians back in Paul's time, and it's true for us now, even, even though circumstances are different. Back then, Christianity was persecuted. Christians were treated poorly and often martyred. And then things changed after Constantine deemed it the official religion of the empire. Christianity was the religion of the Western world and enjoyed privileges and good treatment. And, and that basically continued for a long time. But things since, since the 1950s or so have changed. We, we don't have blue laws on Sundays that require all the businesses to close. We don't have everybody in church on Sundays. And it's not the social norm for your football coach to go to Sunday school with your dad. And they take care of you if you're in, in trouble. A wonderful book by two Duke Divinity School theologians, William Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas, entitled Resident Aliens, talks about this paradigm shift and how things are different now. Willimon tells the story of how when he served a church in Greenville, South Carolina, where I went to school, his church was right next to the synagogue. They shared a parking lot, much like we share a parking lot with the Bank of America. And the Jews parked there for their Friday services, and the Christians parked there for their Sunday services. And it was a good arrangement. And Willimon and the rabbi would get together for coffee on Monday mornings and just decompress about things. And the, one Monday, the rabbi said to Willimon, he said, you know it's tough being a Jew in Greenville. And Willimon said, I can believe that. The rabbi said, we are always having to tell our children that behavior is fine for everyone else, but it's not good for you. You are special. You're a Jew. That language is acceptable for everyone else, but it is not acceptable for you. You're different. You have a different name. You answer to a different story. You are a Jew. Willimon responded, Rabbi, you're not going to believe this, but I heard very much the same statement right here in my own congregation. Yes, one of... The young parents in my congregation said, it's becoming more difficult every day to raise a Christian in Greenville. We are always having to tell our children, you are special, you are different, you are a Christian. His Jewish neighbor lived among a people that never asked society for any favors or props. That congregation, the Jewish congregation, knew that if they were going to stay Jews, they would have to be very intentional. Secularism and the world that we live in is the air that we breathe. It's the culture that we're in. It's just par for the course. And if we're not careful, and we and our children will become part of it. And that's where we can learn from Paul today. He's trying to help the Christians in Ephesus learn to live and thrive in a society that puts them down. And so he says, be strong in the Lord. Put on the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, and shoes that will make you be able to go and proclaim the gospel of peace. Peace. You see, it's not a call to arms against physical armies. 
As he says, our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but cosmic powers of this present darkness. And, and as we go about living the way that God calls us to live, we need to take this advice and put on this armor. If you'll notice, these, all of these pieces of armor are defensive. They all protect you from the wiles of the devil, except one. All protect you from evil except the sword. But before we get into that, one, one radio preacher talking about these defensive, defensive pieces of armor said, There ain't no back plate, so don't turn your back on the devil because you'll get exposed. He's right. I like that. There ain't no back plate. We have to face the things that are evil head on with our armor to protect us and with that one offensive weapon, the sword of truth, the word of God. The other hymn we sang this morning a mighty fortress says, The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. One little word shall fell him. And it goes on to say that that word is Jesus Christ, the living word of God. And so again, as we put on the armor and put on Christ, as we've been talking about this month, we are, we are putting on the necessary garments to live a life in this world reflecting God. If you'll remember when Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Up, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what I believe this says to us is, yes, we are to put on the armor of God to protect ourselves, the truth and the righteousness and the salvation Things we've been given from God. But, as Jesus says, the church is to go on the offensive. We are to take this truth all the way to the gates of hell. We are to take the truth to the, this culture that says our faith doesn't matter anymore. We are to take this truth to, a cult, to those struggling with mental illness. We are to take this truth to those struggling with opioid addiction right here in Orange, or to take this truth to, to the broken homes and broken families, or to take it to political agendas of power and greed, or to take this truth to a world that, that doesn't understand us and take it all the way to the gates of hell that try to lock our friends inside. The church doesn't sit with its armor on and wait the fight out. We take the sword of truth in the word of God, and we walk in our shoes that enable us to proclaim peace, bring it to the world. Peace to the addict, peace to the single mother, to the middle class family who's trying to make it look like they have it all together, but they don't. Peace to immigrants who need a better life by trying to escape their own hell. Peace to the family who has just lost someone we're to bring peace to the troubled teenager and to the anxious first grader. We are to take our fight to where the powers of darkness have control and shine the light of Christ into their lives. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, Army and he chose to be in the worst neighborhoods dealing with the roughest people. And he was quoted once saying, I hungered for hell, meaning that he understood his calling and the calling of Christians to be out where we can influence and make an impact for the most change and good. And that is what we need to do. We can't sit here clothed in our armor, hoping the world doesn't come in. Again, there ain't no backplate. We have to turn and face this world and take the truth that we have, the light of Christ, and shine it. We have to remember who we are. We are God's children, and he's given us this armor to protect us. Willimon, again, told the story of going to preach at a black congregation in a big city where nearly everybody in the church lived in tenement housing. And he got there before the 11 o'clock service to preach, expecting a long, an hour-long service. But there were 
many songs and hymns and time of speaking and singing and hand clapping. And by the time he got up to preach, well, you know how it goes. It was, it was already 1230 and the benediction didn't get pronounced until 115. And he had gotten his first taste of the black church. And he asked his friend, the pastor of the church, why do black people stay in church so long? Our worship lasts no more than an hour. He smiled, and then he explained it to him. Unemployment runs nearly 50% here. For our youth, the unemployment rate is much higher. That means that when our people go about during the week, everything they see, everything they hear tells them, you are a failure. You're a nobody. You are nothing because you don't have a good job, because you don't have a car, fine car, because you don't have any money. So I must gather them here once a week and get their heads straight. I get them together here in church and through the hymns, the prayers, the preaching say, that's a lie. You are somebody. You are royalty. God has bought you with a price and loves you as his chosen people. It takes me so long to get their heads straight because the world perverts them so terribly. I pray that as you come into this place, as you pray the prayers and sing the songs, hear the sermons, that you're gaining armor, the armor you need to go back out and live in a rough place. That you get the equipment that you need to stand up to the darkness and prevail. You are loved. You are chosen. He will protect you and send you to share his love to those who have been consumed by this world. Let us pray. Lord, you love us. And you don't send us out into this turbulent world alone or without help. You give us armor of righteousness, truth, faith, salvation, and your word. May we always clothe ourselves appropriately, knowing that we fight an uphill battle in the world that knows you not, that receives you not, but also knowing that you are with us wherever we go. For we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The offer is always on the table. God is always willing to call you his child, to adopt you into his family. He's paid the price, as the preacher said. He has bought you. And so would you accept that invitation? Take that mantle, that title as a child of God. I'd be down front to talk with you if you'd like to do that for the first time. Or maybe you've been worshiping with us for some time now and you've decided this is the place that your family is going to come together, that we're going to band together and get the armor that we need to make a difference in this community. Whatever decision you have to make, I'll be down front to receive you as we sing our hymn of commitment. Let us sing.
I'd like to remind you that we have our picnic on the property today at 4 o'clock until whenever you all leave. So there will be hamburgers and hot dogs. Bring your long chair and long games and enjoy a great time together. Some of you, I'm just going to take the time to embarrass a good friend, Jimmy Massey, who is here. Some of you may remember Jimmy from years ago when he lived here and went to church with us. And he went to seminary up in New England, and now he's moving to to England to be um, a pastor, a church planter. So um, say hi to Jimmy if you remember Jimmy, and our other good friends are with him, Harrison and Christina. And Jimmy's wife, Allie, is downstairs with Eliza. So say hello if you remember Jimmy. Um, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. But now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.